petitioners to speak directly into the microphone. We record the minutes for legal purposes, and this is the only way to pick up audio. The Historic Preservation Commission is a nine-member board appointed by the City Council and serve on a voluntary basis without compensation. The purposes of the commission are to promote the educational, cultural, economic, and general welfare of the city through the preservation and protection of buildings, sites, structures, areas, and district of historic significance and interest through the preservation and enhancement of local historic, architectural, archeological, and aesthetic heritage found in the city through the maintenance of the distinctive character of the city's historic districts and through the promotion and enhancement of the city's historic and aesthetic attraction to tourists and visitors. I would like to take this opportunity to ask each one of our members to introduce themselves and I'll start from my right and the audience left. Dallas Hanbury. Carol King. Brian Mann. James Long. With that being said, I'd like to recognize the land use staff. To my right and the audience left is Christy Anderson, and to my left and the audience right is Miss Adina Kramer. And again, we'd like to thank them for taking time out from their after work busy schedules to come to this meeting here tonight. With that being said, I'd like to open this meeting by asking our members for an approval of action from the February 12, 2019 meeting. Dr. Bailey, I would, as I was handing these out this evening, noted that we still have a 2018 date um, in the text and I will get that corrected. So if you um, approve the minutes, I would ask that you do that with uh, the date correction. Okay, all right. I move we accept the minutes with the small correction. There's a second. A second, Mr. Chairman. All right. Is there any unreadiness? All those in favor, let it be known by a show of hands. I didn't see uh, Okay, very good. Motion carried. Okay, all right. Now, let's get back to our committee uh, reports. Our first one, revamping the historic sign program. Our working committee is composed of Cindy Keeping and Ms. Carol King. Ms. Cindy Keeping and Ms. Carol King. That would be me. Um, you do have the draft here. We have not um, done any action on this as to, uh, we have one price, um, a new price for new signage, but other than that, we need, we need several more and we need to review our guidelines that you see here. So if anyone has any comments, just let us know. Okay. I did have uh, this, the signage guidelines. I had a couple of questions. Okay. <clears throat> On the first set of dots, you have the word contributing property on some and, and, and just property on the other. What's, what's the significance of contributing, the term? A contributing property is one that contributes something. Uh, no, it um, has to do with whatever the significance of the neighborhood is. The, um, the, a contributing property is usually one that is found within a historic district mm -hmm. versus one that has been individually designated because it has a particular historical or architectural significance. So, um, it's kind of like the others. For, so, for example, mm -hmm. in a neighborhood, you know, I have a, a 1912 bungalow and it contributes to the district. There's nothing super fantastic about it. It's, it, it completes, it helps complete the streetscape of mostly bungalows on my street and it's old enough to um, be considered a historic property. Um, so we would say that my house is contributing to the Capitol Parkway Historic District. Um, an individually designated property like the uh, Dexter Avenue King Memorial Baptist Church, um, the Lomax House, 
Um, trying to think of what else we have individually. They, they are standalones, so we just refer to those as properties. They don't. They, they are inherently contributing because they are individually designated, which means that they met a certain standard on their own. The Bell Building is, is a, an individually designated building. So all of those stand on their own merits where for most of our neighborhoods, a house either contributes to that historic character because it, it's old enough and it maintains its historic integrity of materials and appearance, or it doesn't contribute, meaning it's a newer infill house or it's been modified to the point that you don't recognize that it, there's an old house in there somewhere. So does that, does that help? If I understand what you're saying, that would mean that this list is not complete enough because you got Five. contributing listed, but you don't have individually listed, individually designated listing for these two district categories. That is the uh, local district and the national district should have both contributing category and an individually designated category, if I, if I understand what you're just saying. Well, I think maybe what would help clarify that is, for example, the first bullet says any property locally designated, and maybe that needs to be individually. any individual property right. locally think, designated right. uh -huh. to differentiate it from a contributing property in a historic district. Right. And maybe with, with that, do you think that would fix or that clarify would be helpful. that? Yep. That well, was the it, other question. Like, I think so. Mm -hmm. It yep. says in the first sentence, though, anyway. Signage may be considered for historic property, individual, or located in historic districts. So maybe just add the bullet point. Because the, the first paragraph conveys that. Or, or the, lead. the lead conveys well, that. Well, but, you know, I know the first thing I read are bullets. I don't necessarily read the text of it. So, I mean, well, we, we, could, we could clarify that. Yeah. But to differentiate between the individual um, designations and the district. And then I think on the very last bullet point, yeah, we left out contributing. It should say any contributing property in a district listed on the Alabama register. Yeah, that's what we, we did leave that one out too. So that's right. Well, that definitely would help clarify that a little bit too. You get a gold star for reading. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one thing lawyers do. So. <laughs> that's a really good question. But um, mm -hmm. the other question was on this locally designated. And I had asked this question before when we when we looked at this, and that is, the local designation is by this commission, or who is it by? Is it by this commission? It is a recommendation by this body that goes to city council. City council holds the, the final approval. So it's, can the, the council can do it without going through us? I don't believe so. Okay. So because, it, because the way that the code is written, there's a process that says that a property needs to be documented in a certain way, it needs to meet certain criteria, and that you all need to re make that recommendation to council. I don't think they can just magic wand something into So what I said before, locally designated by the city council upon recommendation of this body. Right. Uh, would probably be better because locally designated to me don't want anybody thinking they can just do it on their own. Right. Out there. It's only locally right. designated by uh, the city council upon recommendation from the HPC. So th this is this may be a good place to insert some like for public education, <clears throat> break break the process down a little more. So okay, good suggestion. Thank you, sir. That take care of your question. Uh, yes. Sir. Okay. I mean your concern, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good enough. Any other concern? Uh, question. I have one that's complete, sure, com completely out the subject, mm -hmm. if that's permitted, Mr. Chairman. Go right ahead. Uh, I like for us as a, a, a working body here, <clears throat> not just, I hope, hope it's not just my opinion, because I've been to, I'm sure some of you have been to council meetings, uh, the audience in the council can actually never hear what's being said up here on the podium. and. Uh, Sometimes you can hear the mayor because he's a little closer to the audience, but uh, I actually recommend that we as a body recommend that the, the council, uh, city council, put some speakers on both sides there so that the audience can actually hear word for word. You, you really don't know actually how anyone vote because they don't always put their hands up and, 
and uh, we just could never hear what the, what's actually being said up here by the councilman. Or uh, we can hear on the, today because the chamber is empty. But uh, normally, you know, when the council's meeting, I know I've I've sat in the second row, and I I, I can't understand. I hear actually most of the, the conversation that comes from up here. Is that the second row from the front? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Now you really can't distinguish every word that's spoken. And that person is speaking directly into the microphone. Yeah, even the person that's 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 speaking in the mic right there, you can't hear, and you can't hear the uh, the the councilman from up here. You can hear sometimes when it's quiet when Mr. President uh, Genright uh, raises his voice, you know, for people to be quiet or sit down <laughs> because you're talking too long. But the the normal uh, course of of, 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 Deliberation. the, of the liberations here and on, 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 on this uh, uh, dais up here, we, we, you just can't hear out there in the audience. And if, the further okay. back you, you sit, the less you can hear. Okay. You know somebody's saying something, but you, you, can, you can never distinguish the words. So. Okay. Christy, can you hear us okay? I can hear you. Yeah, it's an empty chamber. But, uh, but, oh, I, can I, see. I, but I can, I I can certainly <laughs> I cast that mm -hmm. along. Um, right. You know, which is why in the meeting procedure instructions, we tell people to speak directly into the microphone because if I turn my head, you can't, you can't hear me as well. And I think up there, a lot of the side conversations, when people lean over and start talking, you lose it. You, you don't pick it up. And that's, they may want that, but um, the, these are somewhat directionally sensitive to work properly. Well, just a recommendation uh, because I, I know I've said here many times, and, and, and like you said, sometimes they're not speaking directly in the mic, and, and, and sometimes even if so, unless they raise their voice, you know, there's always some chatter in the chamber, and you really can't distinguish what's being said. And, so, and you're recommending? That they play some speakers that's pointed down toward the audience so they can actually hear what's being uh, discussed up here. <coughs> okay, all right. Krista, how do we? Make that recommendation. I will, I will just try to pass that along. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I don't, I don't think you all need to do, all I don't right. think that warrants a okay. motion. Okay. Do you, uh, do, do think, you so. think that we need additional speakers also? Well, I, I, I certainly think if you had two pointed down and if, if, if you could place another one in the center in the back, that would probably help as well as for the audience out there because you have a, a basically a packed chamber here. Most people are not going to know what the heck was going on up here. They, they vote, and you don't know what they're voting for. You follow the agenda, but sometimes they move so fast, uh, they, they make statements that, uh, you know, from one or the other, and you just really can't hear what's being said. And I think it's a disservice to the public that they can't actually hear it clearly and distinctly, you know, what's occurring in the chamber. Okay. And, and, uh, an observation, it appears that they only have one speaker and a subwoofer. But I bet you this one speaker could blow us out of here because it's a Bose. Mm -hmm. And if they, it's the position of that speaker. Right. If it were, I mean, they can't turn it up because it would it'd blow out That's true. somebody's ears because That's it's true. right there. That is the only speaker. Well, the acoustics it, are bad in here. But, oh, okay. I see a subwoofer, this one. But this system would blow us out of here. You could make it sound like Hank Williams was live and in person. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know. They don't make speakers bad, better than so this. I, I, don't, I don't agree. Right. And, and at the same time, I've noticed some people, you may have a good uh, acoustic system. Some people will come right and speak directly to the microphone. It seems like they're speaking at the, at, the, at the top of their voices, not realizing that um, it's too loud. The sound is too loud. So. Well, just an observation because I've, I think I've, I've, I've said on, on many uh, occasions in here, and I'm, I'm always training to hear, and I'm not the only one. I said, "What did they say? Who voted what?" And right. most people can't ask my question because okay. you know they don't they don't hear it. Okay. Is that something you might also want to direct to your city councilman, perhaps on maybe a one-to-one -one basis? Since I imagine you know you are attending meetings, you probably know him or her pretty well anyway. <clears throat> uh, you know, I might know him, but that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> well, you know, we're a democracy, so if that doesn't mean anything, that's troubling. It is troubling to me. It has been for the past okay. three years, I promise you. But anyway, thank you so much for, for your observation. And uh, let's get back to the report. Um, do you have anything else you no, want to add? Uh, any other question or comment regarding the report? All right. No. 
So, Christy, um, do you have a comment, a concluding comment regarding her report? I do not. Okay, all right. Thank you so much. Um, so everybody's on the same page regarding what um, has come to us with this report. I want to speak directly to the mic. Which report are we talking about now? Well, we're talking about the very first one regarding the historic sign. Okay. Revamping the historic sign program. Yes. All right. Good enough. Okay. We will proceed to our second report, and that is the preservation leadership class. Who would like to take that? Uh, I'll speak to it. Good enough. Thank you. Go right ahead. I just want to say that Christy Anderson has done some heavy, heavy lifting and done a fine job putting this program together. I think it's going to be fantastic. She sent out an email today saying that there were only two slots remaining of the, what is it, 25, 30, 25? And uh, they got the tote bags, they got the t-shirts. I'm sure there are going to be some nice, what do you call it, in the tote bag? Got some swag. Swag. And um, I just can't say good enough things about it. And I, I think my alma mater will be a wonderful venue, Huntington College, to host the first several meetings. And uh, anyway, thank you, Christy, for all your hard work. Any other comment? Christy, would you like to say something about the leadership class? Um, I, the comment I made on Carol's post on Midtown Montgomery li Living was, call me oh, Montgomery. <laughs> well, I got two slots left. So oh, yes, if anybody, if anybody about. wants okay. to yeah, um, sign up for that, registration closes Friday. Um, so. I would add, if anybody in, is actually watching this on YouTube, uh, we've discussed it, this at prior meetings, but this is the first historic preservation seminar uh, of the Historic Preservation Commission, and it is one, two, three, four, what am I, is this seven? Is it six or seven? Six. What am I counting? Um, there are actually There's six, a graduation. six class six. sessions. Six in a graduation session. Yeah. And uh, history of Montgomery, architectural architecture of Montgomery's historic districts, preservation in the law, architecture review board, renovation and code issues, uh, a picnic out at Oakwood Cemetery, which I believe will be a tour. There will be. And then a graduation here, beginning April 3rd, concluding May 14th. Okay, and uh, as you've already alluded to, all of this will be held except for the venue at uh, Oakwood Cemetery will be held at uh, Huntington, College. Uh -huh. Huntington College. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And I think the next time we probably will see each other is at our first class on April 3rd uh -huh. for the history of Montgomery. And uh, I think all of this will be uh, very important. All right. Any comments anyone wants to make regarding our leadership preservation class? And I, I have talked to Griffith Waller, who works in kind of our external communications, and he said we could borrow a camera and a tripod if we decide we want to record the sessions, and then maybe we, we want to post those um, on the city's YouTube <coughs> channel somewhere down the road. We don't sure. want to do it too soon. I want people to think they missed something, but right. um, we, we do have that option available to us. Mm -hmm. Very good. Chris, let me just ask this one question. We have two slots remaining. Mm -hmm. What happens if we get four people who want to come? First come, first serve. First come, first serve. Oh, so we just turn. I, I only have, now, we could probably accommodate a couple more, but they would not get the full swag. I got you. Okay. All right. And they will understand that. Well, <laughs> if, if they're one of those four. <laughs> Or okay. we can just tell them no. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. But that's a good problem. It is. It is. It very is a good, good problem. Yeah, a good problem. I'm, I'm very pleased with the um, turnout because several of the the historic districts are actually paying or sponsoring some of their residents to come. Um, so they've not only provided financial support to the program, but they're also providing financial support to 
some of their residents to attend as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, actually, I'm looking forward to all of these classes, actually. Um, 2019 awards, Working Committee, Cindy Keeping, Doug McCant, James Long. All right. Well, do, I <laughs> well, mean, they're, they're really in a holding pattern until two things happen. Um, the application deadline is Friday for the award, so we need we need applications to review, and the number of people who sign up for the class will in part determine how much budget I can give them to plan the reception for the awards program. So they're kind of in a holding pattern until we get a couple of things nailed down, although they have, they have started collecting or um, putting together possible menus and a budget of what ex expected expenses, and I will let them know what I can give them okay. for that. Good enough. Any comments? Anyone has anything you want to question or something you want to add? Oh, she, she's done a good job. We, we've discussed caterers and uh, program and all that, and we're waiting for her to give us some figures, and we'll be probably ready to finalize. Okay. Yeah, because that, that will give us the numbers we need um, for like getting things like invitations printed because we need to know how many people in the class, you know, how many awards we have, and who all, because there's a, we, last year I think we invited the nom, the nominator mm -hmm. and the nominees, and sometimes there were multiple. If it was a an investor and then the contractor, and you know there there may be multiple people who are invited. So we'll be able to start kind of getting a better picture of how many people we need to invite, what our printing costs or needs are going to be, and and what our reception needs are going to be. Okay. Does anybody have any any? Uh... Uh, information regarding Cindy when she returned, or if she's returning, or family situation. Um, I. It's just kind of waiting for nature to take its course. I'm I'm afraid, so I don't know. Um, okay. So I will I will be your your substitute, Cindy. How about that? Fine. <laughs> we um we talked about the uh, resolution. Yes. Uh, preservation. Will that be read on that 14th day or? We, we, I will put together the resolution for you all to um, approve next no, this month. This was uh, right, and then the but mayor. Will I read think it. we decided that we would like council to look at it at their May seventh right. meeting, which is their first meeting in May. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I'll, I'll, I will be putting those together, be okay. and maybe we can do a little better job because I think the mayor had expected a, a proclamation at some point and right. to be honest I don't know what I don't know what the difference is between a resolution and a proclamation I thought I thought we'd maybe done what we needed to do. the number of whereas is I don't know. So um, <laughs> I, I don't know so I will I'm going to do some some checking on that too um, to make sure we get the most bang for our buck mm -hmm. and um, hopefully we can kind of use that as a, a springboard to announce the awards program and graduation, which would be the next week. Okay. One other thing, Mr. Chairman, uh, not necessarily related to the previous discussion, but uh, since we're the Preservation Commission <coughs> and uh, many of our neighborhoods are in a blighted condition and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the the um, I think it's the, the one of the city departments, Mr. Coates is his name. Um, Probably Chris Conway, Public Works Conway, yeah, director. Right. Yes. Right, Conway. They 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 have come up with a database identifying uh, some eighty three thousand properties and two thousand of those properties in immediate distress. And. Revitalization is, uh, you know, is just a conversation in this city, and I think it needs to go beyond that. <clears throat> I don't know what we can do to contribute to finding ways to end in, end in the blight in this city. Uh, 
I know other communities have, have accomplished it. It, it. Some have taken years, some as much as 20 years. I recall my own hometown in Ohio. Uh, it took 20 years, but uh, it, 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 it uh, became to fruition. Of course, there were urban renewal funds available during that time frame, and I'm sure those funds have dried up. But uh, there are other communities that have achieved some success in, in, in some neighborhoods, and uh, it, it, it took uh, several entities within and without that community and the city and state and uh, they have rehabbed those neighborhoods and they are shining an example of, of when the community and, and, and uh, it's, 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 uh, officials come together. And I, I think that we as a commission uh, are kind of remiss if we don't at least make sure, certain that this is a uh, 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 important issue for us as well. Uh, I don't know what all we can do about it other than maybe some research that will help out. Uh, but we do have a planning commission that's second to none. And uh, uh, I'm sure we have people there who can also assist. Maybe we could form some kind of a committee with the citizenry and uh, uh, city officials and, and see if we can begin not just a dialogue but uh, 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 start making some strategic uh, 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 advances with respect to, you know, step by step. I, I would suggest you look at Restore Mobile's website. Um, Ooh, it's a I'm not sorry. Restore Mobile. I think it's restoremobile.org. Um, it is a nonprofit in Mobile that does just that. I don't know how they acquire their properties, but they, <clears throat> they do a combination of selling rehabbed properties and selling kind of gems in the rough and but mobile had, has been very successful in um, clearing title for properties as well um carrie kumanis kind of spearheaded that and I, carrie and i worked at the historical commission at the same time and she she went on and managed to get a law degree so she's a lot smarter than i am about these things but um they they, they do have something that might work and and that combined with the new IRS opportunity zones where you have investment funds that would target projects that is, I think at least locally, the efforts um, toward establishing a local fund is being driven by the Chamber of Commerce. So there, there may be some conversations that could be had that, we, that could do just that. Um, I don't think there's any need to reinvent the wheel um, we just need to, we just need some wheels. Well, I think it was a, uh, a serious and concerted effort. Uh, uh, these issues can be over, overcome. I, <clears throat> uh, Councilman Larkin came up with uh, a proposal that was shot down and I, I'm sure it had some, some flaws in it and it said it was in, unenforceable, but uh, uh, at least he uh, uh, made an effort and there was supposed to be a second one that I'm not aware of. And uh, they've been actually talking about this for several years, and the, the, the problem gets worse, you know, year by year. In fact, day by day, month by month. Uh, the policy of the city is to allow the profits to completely de deteriorate until they, until they become a safety hazard. And I think that policy is, is, is just, you know, off the wall. You know, I, I mean, what do you, you, you? Some of these properties could be saved, but there's no there are no mechanisms to to, to do so, and uh, it doesn't appear that the leadership in the city, you know, is, is serious about it. It's one thing to, 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 to develop a database to tell you where the properties are, but then so what? You know, I know we all see them, whether we know everyone individually or by neighborhood or not, unless you live in a neighborhood. The point is, you know, where do we go from? Uh, database to uh, uh, resurrection, and that's my problem. And I think we are supposed to be. Uh, some of those neighborhoods are, in fact, historic because they're more than 50 plus years old. They may not be in a historic uh, register. It doesn't. It, it, it doesn't also say that there aren't people who have achieved some notoriety in our city and and state and national. Uh, 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 didn't uh, uh, come from some of those areas. In fact, I know darn well there are some. And uh, I just think that uh, we should certainly get involved in the restoration and the preservation 
of our city because it's, it's really coming apart at the seams and it's uh, all of our problem. And uh, I just think that the council, you know, need to uh, grow a few. I won't say what. And uh, let's, let's, let's try to get some serious efforts, at least put some, some, some committees or something together and see how do we get, get started on uh, correcting this. Because it's just going to get worse. And it's, and it's a poor, it's a poor uh, example for this supposed, supposedly his, historic city. I mean, it just doesn't look good. I mean, you make the wrong turn here, coming off the trail, and uh, you know, you, you can be devastated by what you see. So. Well, that's a good segue into something that I wanted to tell you all about um, on the happier end of kind of what you're talking about. Um, Historic England for Valentine's Day this year did a Celebrate the Buildings You Love um, program where they were asking people to write love letters to buildings. And I think, you know, part of, uh, I think that kind of gets at, at least as, as for the community awareness part of it, of, you know, some of these places are places that, that tug on people as what they think of as home or, you know, make them think of home. And I would, I would ask that you all consider maybe we try to do something similar to this. Maybe we find each of you write a love letter or someone who's known in the community could write a love letter that we could launch and get others to tell us their stories about the places that are important to them. Um, on the flip side, we could also do what's the scariest place? <laughs> Ghost stories of Montgomery kind of for Halloween too. But um, anyway, but that, that kind of speaks to the community engagement of, uh, th there seems to be a lot of, yes, that's a problem, but that's not my problem to solve. Um, and making, making some of these ideas more um, graspable, like I can do something about it, maybe, maybe that's a, it's a place to start anyway. It's not probably, it's not the only thing that would need to be done, certainly, but um, just getting people to engage with their community and recognize that, you know, all of our neighborhoods have unique qualities um, they're not, they don't look the same and, and their history is not the same, but they all make up that historic fabric of the city <coughs> that tells the story of how the city developed, um, you know, where the dividing lines were. It, it's all important. Well, I'm not just blowing smoke here. I, I hope we all would take what I said into consideration. No demands here. I just think that uh, we all care about our city and the condition is, 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 is in and, and where it's headed and, and at that weekend as a, as a commission here sort of turn, help turn this corner. Uh, litter is a serious problem. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really a serious problem. Our streets are in major disrepair and I mean some of our main thoroughfares. And of course our housing is, 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 is blighted in, in many neighborhoods and not just the the, the worst neighborhoods, and, and, and even the Garden District, there are uh, a lot of blighted uh, properties. And I just think we as a commission ought to at least uh, 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 give a, uh, come together and give a resolution and, and, and give it to the city fathers uh, 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 and uh, let them know that uh, we are willing to work with them and, and, and uh, do whatever's necessary to, to put together some kind of a, a program to get started on something other than just collecting information about blight. Well, how about I do this? How about I talk to Thomas Carr, who's heading up that initiative, um, which is supposed to have a revitalization component, not just a demolition component to it. Let me talk to him and Shelby Stringfellow at the Chamber, who has been working on the Opportunity Zone piece of it. And if I could get them together in a room, would you, would you, who, would, who would want to sit in on that discussion? Absolutely. I would too. And maybe Mr. Larkin? Okay. I, I was waiting for you to finish your discussion because I wanted to say something about this. I'm so, done. Go, go, go right ahead. <laughs> I, I just... Uh, I, I'm glad you offered that because I, I believe that I personally would want 
and a report on what the city, what is going to be the plan uh, to, to deal with this. I, I represent District 6, which is south of the uh, bypass, but my office is in District 3, which is a historic district, and it has more, and my church is also in the district that has the most vacant properties in the city. And so it is a very important issue to, uh, to me and, and, and the people in my church. We actually have talked about this issue. Um, the, uh, the, the proposal that was on the table was very broad, and there were some concerns with it. Um, and I think our representative uh, from District 6 echoed some of those. But that doesn't mean it, that the process should be dropped. I think having a database is a good step. I mean, you're going to have to do that anyway. That's right. Well, that's a good step, but the process should not stop. I don't know if the procedure, and I read and we commented on the actual resolution itself. It was very broad. It would require people who didn't necessarily have vacant properties or didn't keep up vacant properties to actually do things on a regular basis. And that, I don't know, maybe there's a process that more directly attacks the problem of who is not keeping up their properties. But that, that's something that should be discussed and it should be attacked and attacked directly and have, uh, have, have direct action against those people who are not keeping up their properties. And uh, so I would not want that process to stop. I think it should go beyond just listing on a database. And so we would support that. Matter of fact, the people we talked to, and even in my church, Shallow, which is in that area, said we, would, we even got properties <laughs> like, that we keep up. So I want to do that. And I think we back doing that. Um, and I don't, I, I, I guess finally I'm saying I, I would like at some point when the city gets to the point where it's going to do what it's going to do with regard to this website, understand more of what that is and what is the plan for dealing with that and how that impacts the, the properties in the historic districts particularly. Any other comment? <clears throat> Let me just uh, congratulate you, Commissioner McKenzie for that observation. And what you've added, uh, Commissioner Long, there is no reason this should be dropped. And your point about what the Historic Preservation Commission should be doing is absolutely on time. Let us be about doing that. So, Christy, when uh, you get ready for the person who've uh, agreed to meet let us see what is it that we can do as a body to ensure that something happens good as a result of all of this and that it just doesn't get dropped. Go right here. Why don't if you can get that together, why don't we uh, do like we did that one time and go actually have an official meeting over there in the other room around the conference table and have a, a, a work session yeah. essentially? <laughs> Yeah, I think this is a pretty multifaceted issue that requires a work session or two before we proceed. Um, this is exciting and, and good, but we're speaking in generalities right now. And I, I second my colleague in suggesting a work session or two. I before just thought we he proceed. might be an interesting speaker to just talk to us about what this program is right. at one of our own meetings, but to do it around a table where we could really have some interaction with questions and comments and. It, it, that was my suggestion. Not so much a work session, but a, a regular meeting, but sit down. Right. With, well, we've done that so where we could have a round table discussion. Yes. yes. That's sure. what I meant. I tried to pull that out and got work session. Round you table. will work on that? I okay. will. I will see what availability might be um, for a, a, a regular meeting schedule uh, or one of our regular meetings to, to do that. All right. So it'd either be April or June is what we'd be looking sure. at. So, Mr. Chairman, then, since it will be April or June, do we need to put <laughs> on the next agenda then this discussion in terms of I think we need to discuss this further is, where, is my position. I think it's important, but I think we're, we're in the exciting brainstorming phase, and I sure. think we need to, at a regular meeting, make this uh, 
an agenda item, if not the first agenda item, so we can devote some time to it a little further than what we've done sure. today. Do you think April is too soon? Well, I, I suppose that depends on what you want that initial discussion to be whether it, it's an information gathering where it probably wouldn't be too soon, where someone who's familiar with the program and any sort of initiatives you're looking at implementing would be able to at least provide that information without any expectation that you all would have immediate feedback on it. Um, unless, unless you feel you need to hash out what you think your role needs to be, but I think that might be more difficult to do, not know, not having, and not having all the information, or I don't know that we have enough information to hash that out. And the information is fine. I, I think I, I think they can, uh, Mr. Carr and others similarly uh, involved can uh, bring what information they have. I mean, the first thing, of course, is what's 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 being done now is to first identify, you know not the problem, but where the problem is, is the greatest, and uh, how do we uh, <clears throat> attack, you know, the next step would be how do we uh, a plan around to, to, uh, uh, to, to gather resources, you know, to uh, attack some of these issues. We, that, that, that can be people, organizations, chamber of commerce, city, state, county officials, what have you, because we all uh, in this together. Uh, and, and, and uh, of course, can give some examples of other communities, you know, through research that have uh, had success and how they attacked the problem, how they solved it. Certainly, every community is different, every state's different, laws are different. I accept that and expect that. Uh, but uh, I, I think that's the, 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 the first thing. And so, the first meeting, you know, actually, the sooner the better, because if, as soon as you get something started, then, uh, you know, there's some follow-ups. But if you keep putting something off, then, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the idea kind of fades. So. Well, let, uh, let, me, let me start with Chris Conway and Thomas Carr and also Brandon Hodge, who, is, who heads up code enforcement. So a lot yeah. of this is going to fall on him. And hopefully, at least one of the three would be able to come and talk about it. Yeah, and at, le at least get some information out on the table, and then maybe when we have our regular June meeting, we can have another roundtable discussion and kind of hash out, okay, what, what do we do with this information? It's probably premature to, to approach um, the chamber to talk about opportunity zones, because that, that's really getting into the financial implementation of something. Um, but probably the city policy side or, or um, enforcement and what their plans are t to reach that revitalization goal, which I've been told is a piece of it, but I don't know what that piece is, would, would probably be helpful in this discussion. Well, I, I talked to Brandon several, I've talked to him several times, and, and Mr. Hodge is pretty much up on whatever the city's uh, intentions are. Uh, uh, my last uh, impression of when, once they identified the, the 2,000 properties are were that, uh, well, we're going to do something about it in the future. Uh, that was entirely too abstract for me. <laughs> you know, I don't know what future and, and you're I talking think, about. I don't think they have a plan. I don't think so. I mean, I think that, and that's my, I mean, that was my it's, impression. It's, it's, it is a work in progress. Absolutely. Um, and I don't think that that means there's no intention to do anything. I just don't think that they know how this is going to work because, you know, when I have when I have to enforce violations, and they're in the same boat that I am, we take the complaint to municipal court, which is only good if you can get that individual served. And if that individual doesn't live in Montgomery, well, good luck with that, you know? And I don't know, I mean, I don't know if there's a way to kick some of this stuff. I mean, we're, we're hamstrung by state enabling legislation about what, what municipalities can do and how they can enforce things. I don't know if there is another legal mechanism of, you know, it, but if I have an out-of-state owner, I just, and they, they don't get served, then nothing ever happens. The best I can do is record a violation with the deed and pass it on to the next owner that, oh, by the way, you've got to fix this. Um, you know, and, and, and that, that is, that can be crippling when you're looking at, one of the things they pulled up in the demonstration of that was the number of 
either out of state or in state, but out of city owners of some of these properties and tracking them, tracking them down and make something stick is, is tricky. Well, I've had that problem uh, because I'm a neighborhood association president, and in fact, that, that comes up often. Uh, there are rem remedies, it's just as they say, we couldn't serve anyone around here uh, for violations. Uh, uh, before Miss uh, uh, Regina, who was at Over Bonds, left, she got a neighbor uh, of mine served, got, went to the police and asked them to serve it because it made no sense that they, you got a stack of letters up there of violators and you can't get these people served. So she actually got one served, and, and, and Paula said, well, how did you do that? I said, well, you know, I did what uh, I thought was smart to do. I mean, because it makes no sense that you can't serve these people. You have these sheriffs running around and sitting, and policemen running around serving. And, uh, and so what, what, what about these uh, 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 city ordinance violations that you can't get served? I mean, that's not rocket science. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. You know, you understand what I'm saying? And, and, and I'm not trying to cast any aspersions on anyone. I'm just simply saying, that, I mean, what's the point of having an uh, ordinance and, and then you get a violator and then uh, the person don't, won't accept certified mail uh, or any service in that fashion? A certified letter that tells them that they've got something to pick up at the Yeah, well, I mean, like me, I, I, I don't, I don't accept up. certified mail because I don't, <laughs> unless I know where it's coming from. But, and I'm sure they feel the same. But my point is, there's an actual of service of, 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 of a warrant or of a, 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 a violation that the, the sheriff does every day. They have little bitty cars they run around in, you know, low, uh, low uh, gas burning uh, vehicles. Uh, the, 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 the police does it, you know, for, for, for criminal as well as uh, other type warrants and, and, and civil. So, I mean, you mean to tell me the city has a police force and you don't have anybody to serve these warrants? I realize it, it, it may overlap and may cause them a little bit more work to do, but uh, then maybe perhaps you need to hire some people for service. I mean, we, well, we, uh, we have to get this done. I, I would agree that the fact that you may have a lot of out-of-state people doesn't justify you ignoring the people that you can get in Montgomery. So that should be there should be some percentage of this problem that is attackable. We can do what we can do. I mean, even, even just hiring one person who all, <clears throat> all they did was serve the environmental court issues, which are my, my violations and building code and enforcement <clears throat> nuisance violations, um, we go a long way. You get yours served? Sometimes. Yeah, Sometimes I'm given a court date, and then when we check on it, they're like, oh, no, they haven't picked up their, their uh, notice to appear. Well, they're not going to pick it up, so you actually have to, had, the, the, I had the same problem. The people would never been pick up the, 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 the certified mail, so uh, the policeman didn't serve the warrant. And the, the person went to court, he got a fine, and they made a, a, a deal where if, uh, you know, you can do this, you can do that on the property, but you can't do this. And uh, that... Uh, pretty much ended the problem. But uh, this went on for over a year. And it just got frustrated because, I mean, that means you can continue to violate the ordinance, you can continue to disturb your neighbor, uh, and, and why should we have to put up with that? Christy, the, okay, so the things that we're talking about in terms of um, landlords who live out of state or out of the community, but I'm not very familiar with the, the, the process of creating and enforcing legislation in Alabama. I'm not an elected official. I don't know. But it sounds to me like this is leg the legislation governing these properties is created at the state level, correct? It is. So are we, it, it seems as if then uh, the correct body, if you will, uh, we, you know, is whoever represents our community at the state house. There are representative on the hill. I mean, this sounds like For you know th this this issue obviously is an issue, right? But um, at the local level, I, I mean, well, I think it, we can do some things, but it sounds like really the key issue here is state legislation that we have no control over. I, I think that the piece that you all could participate in is on the problem solving end, not the not the enforcement component of right. it. Right. But okay, so. We have these problem properties. What do we do? So the you know the city already has a process in place that if this 
that the if there's tax sale property that they will get that into the hands of a nonprofit um, for a minimal cost. Um, they they will acquire the property from the state and then pass that on to a nonprofit. Um, so you know there are, there may be opportunities and and some of this mapping these mapping features will help pinpoint because one of the layers is state tax sale property of you know so if 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 part of the revitalization effort involves the creation of a nonprofit to handle some of these properties to either do the renovations or partner with someone who will then it may be possible to get some of those properties back into productive use sure and that's um, and that's great and that's but, that's one of many tools but I, what i'm saying and that's great and that's something that's but definitely the, worth but the enforcement issue is a yes we we are bound by the state enabling legislation on how we can pursue things, what fines can be levied by the judge. Um, so I guess what I'm saying then is, um, and I know it can be an intimidating process or one in which people don't know a lot about, but it sounds like uh, those who are concerned about blight in their communities, which should be all of us, right? We live in Montgomery, we should be concerned about blight. Uh, is to if you're concerned about that to reach out to your representative and um, I know that may seem corny or what have you but I mean we're a democracy right so reach out to your representative who who has reached out and pressured their representative to say hey we're having this issue in our community what have you done and what are you preparing to do I haven't heard that um, very much well it, it, it one of the, the uh, uh, districts uh, Council and I won't call a name or a oh, district. No, I mean oh well, you can always get uh, the legislator from your uh, from you know That's what from I'm my saying. district. I can ask him to, to propose legislation, but I'm I'm just talking about we can do what we can do. And, and, and but and, I'm saying and, for the average and, person, and, that's something that they can do is yeah. they can write an email, they can call whatever um, to their state representative because yeah, there's these local tools that we have and that's great, that's awesome, and we should utilize these tools like the one Christy was mentioning. But on the other hand, we do have state representatives, and in Alabama, the, the, the legislature holds a lot of power, a lot of power centralized in that elected body. Um, and I think that among these other endeavors that we're discussing, which are uh, definitely tools that are available, um, that is another tool that is easily available. There are these things called elections, um, and we do have them fairly regularly, and, and, and uh, you know, you do have a representative you can reach out to. Um, well, I agree, but, and, and, and you're absolutely correct. It should be that way, but this is Alabama, and the moment you throw your hat in the ring to try and change something, they make it political. And we're not interested in politics here. We want to do what we can do based on the city ordinances and based on the direction that we want the city to go and our cooperation as citizens and, and, and so forth. And, and, and do what we can do. And uh, we can always ask the state rep to propose legislation to do something about these uh, out-of-state uh, property owners in terms of setting deadlines and what have you, and the tax properties, was the state want to just abandon their uh, ownership of the property and just deed it over to the city? I mean, all these things can be done, but I'm just simply saying, let's do what we can do locally, you know, with, 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 with what resources we have and those that we can get from maybe some other fund, funding sources. But let's get at the, after the problem, and uh, uh, let's let's try and stay away from the politics as as, as much as but, possible. But um, yeah, and I understand that. But and, and and I agree with you. But I'll also say that the state house is concerned about matters related to tax um, list properties. Uh, a case in point would be the revisions that they've made to the tax sale process in terms of, for example, the uh, interest rate. Um, that accrue, you know, so if you buy a, a, the taxes at a tax sale, uh, it was what, what 1.12% or something, they've now revised that. Um, yeah, of course it's political, all of this is political ultimately, um, but, uh, you know, I will tell you that um, the people who we elect to serve are from this community and I imagine that they uh, have these thoughts on, on, on the brain as well. So I think both at the local level but at the state level, um, you know, uh, nothing has the enforcement like the state of Alabama in Alabama, is all I'm saying. Uh, well, this is an election year, so Mr. this is a good uh, time to I, make sir, I have to say that on this issue, I, I have to 
have to agree with Commissioner McCants. I, when I was in state government, I spent most of my time at the state house. Uh, part of my, one of my jobs was to deal with legislators. This is primarily a local problem here. The city has uh, the authority to do ordinances that governs the properties in its area. Most of the time, legislature ain't gonna do anything unless the, the, the units, the governmental units governing that area has approved what the state is proposing. So you back to the same problem. That is, what does the city of Montgomery want to do with regard to property in, in its city limits? And I think that the city should not abrogate this responsibility to deal with that in favor of the state doing it first. The state doesn't have a general code of anything on housing. Oh, and oh, it, while some states do, Alabama has not chosen to do that. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm saying <laughs> not advocating responsibility at the local level. I'm saying that there are multiple levels at which a problem can be attacked. Um, and I think that when you're working on multiple levels, the chances for advancement of some kind uh, increase. That's all I'm saying. Okay, if that's all you're saying, that's fine. And the, the, under the powers and duties that you all have, the piece of this that you can really participate in as a body is that revitalization piece, the solution to the problem piece. Your, your job is not to enforce right. property maintenance or blight issues. That does not fall under the purview of this body. That's but so working somebody. with those entities in a way that helps achieve the same goal you know, let, let them do the enforcement part, but what, what's the piece to pick up? Okay, so what if you can get these properties out of the hands of people who don't want to take care of them? What do you do with them if you can't find another owner or another entity to take them and to take on that responsibility and make that investment? I mean, there's, there's got to be someone there to catch the ball once code enforcement puts a squeeze on someone hard enough that they decide they're going to toss the ball. You know, and I think that that is really where the HPC could come in and play a vital role in this because it's not enough just to fine or punish an owner if they're going to keep doing the same thing. Um, you know, if they if they decide they're going to sell or walk away from their property, you've got to have you've got to have something in place to follow to follow up with that otherwise you just have an abandoned a completely abandoned property with the same problem so there there's got to be a mechanism whether it's it's creating neighborhood coalitions of nonprofits um, that have you know a little bit of money from a whole bunch of people can go a long way you know we've done several projects like that in my neighborhood where people put in what they could um, to save something, and it's worked. Um, it can be a big headache, but, <laughs> but it has worked. Um, but I think, I think for the HPC, y'all need to be thinking, put the, the thinking hat on of, okay, so what do we do? What, what do we do to revitalize? What, what is our role in revitalization? How do we find the investors and the partners and the neighborhood movers and shakers who are going to take these properties on once, once once our friends over here in code enforcement get the property away or, you know, convince someone to sell. Well, I, for one, intend to look at this Mobile link. You, I need to write it down. You said it was called what? Restore Mobile. And uh, if we can Dot get org. that Dot session org. going where we can see what the problem is and what the scope of the problem is, I think we'll be heading in the right direction. But we need more facts. So especially those of us that are unfamiliar with the, the problem. Uh, I don't, we don't have a whole lot of vacant houses over where I am, but I know if I head toward the garden district, there are. Uh, and I have been down near Cloverland to some houses and seen a lot of you know, empty spaces down there. And in, what is it, Highland? Uh, Highland Park. Highland Park has yeah, a lot of empty. It does. But I really, as people tell me, don't live, leave the Cloverdale bubble very often, uh, except go to court. So it, it'll be a real, I, I look forward to hopefully meeting this man with the computer system to show us what the problem is and to, to how great of an extent it affects uh, the historic areas. Uh, I, I'll say this and, 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 and I'm done for the day. 
<clears throat> and I hate to belabor this point, but one other thing I want you all to consider is that when the houses are abandoned, and eventually when they begin to just completely deteriorate, what the city does, they end up contracting out to have the property torn down. There are several streets where many of those, those, those properties, abandoned properties, were demolished. Now, what, what happens once those, those properties are, de are demolished? I'll tell you what happens. I'm glad you asked. You, 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 you uh, acquire a no man's land. And if you, if you don't understand what I mean by that, overgrown trees, I mean, it's uh, uh, wild animals uh, can uh, inhabit it. Trash. Nobody, trash, nobody takes care of it anymore. And they're just, just whole blocks of just what I call no man's land because it's and not even safe to be in, in those areas. And, and the land's not and, worth And that's enough. coming. That's, and, in fact, it's already here. And the land's not worth enough for someone to want to come in and build a new house because it's cost prohibitive. You know, the, your, your investment, you would be putting more money into a house than it would be worth. Well, and the bad um, thing is because on this side of the street, there are well-kept homes. And on this side of the street, you have a no man's land. Which means you haven't solved the problem. Well, you got another problem now, you, you because created, not all the wild animals are coming across the street, you know, yeah. where people are taking care of their properties, and then any vagrants or in the trash and so forth is, you know, it, it, you understand what I'm saying? It's a disease that'll spread. Absolutely. Right. And, and it infringes on people who are actually taking care of their properties, and I can take you to areas where that's actually that's right. uh, has that's occurred. Right. Uh, Christy, can you try to get those people? Yeah, we'll try. I will talk agenda. to them. Thank I'll get with them much. in the next couple of days. Thank you very much. This is a very good discussion. Very good discussion. Okay. Well, I'm glad we're having it. Right. Good discussion. Okay. Anything else? Anything else? We have two guests in our three in our audience this afternoon. Either one of you would like to approach the podium and say a few <clears throat> words. You got two and a half minutes. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Tell us who you are and Ernest Claybon, 1832 Spiegel Street, uh, District 3, Highland Gardens. And I just uh, wanted to know, uh, I wanted to talk to you briefly. I watch you on YouTube, so it's a pleasure to be here. But Edith Irby Jones, have any of you ever heard of her? Edith Irby Jones, our patients, Claybon. Okay, that's my mom, and I just want to tell you about it real quick. A long time ago, there was a young man who was visionary, and he was a lot like Donald Trump, except he was smart, he cared about other people, and he was compassionate. Donald Trump said he was going to build a wall, and Mexico was going to pay for it. This man said he was going to build a school, and the white man was gonna pay for it. And in 1880, with a lot of ingenuity, with the help of the Alabama State Legislature, rich philanthropists, he built this wonderful institution, Tuskegee University. And he made it work because he was smart enough to have that goal, but never say it. He gave a famous speech, the Atlanta Compromise speech, where he said that the races should so stay as separate is digits of the hand, but if you notice, they're pretty close together. And he did it. He went on and he raised the money because he made it look like it was just going to be an agricultural institution, but it was kind of like Wakanda. And there was chemistry there, there was physics there, there was literature there, and he built this wonderful school. And a strange thing happened in Arkansas. In 1952, a young lady, a black woman, Edith Irby Jones, graduated from medical school. Now, how did she get accepted to the University of Arkansas? I don't know. Maybe they didn't look at the photo on the application. Maybe there was no interview process. But she was an outstanding student. In undergraduate, she had three different majors, and she got accepted. But there were barriers placed after that. When she went to the University of Arkansas, it was segregation. She couldn't eat in the cafeteria, she couldn't live there, she couldn't use the restroom, but they let her go to medical school, so I guess she took that option. But there was barriers placed after that. 
for years and years. If you were in the South, you could not go to a primary white institution. As great as Tuskegee was, is, as great as Alabama State is, as great as Talladega College is, Miles College, there was no HBCU with the medical school. But my mother, she was born around the same time Edith Thurby Jones got her degree. She went to Burroughs Slater High School. She, she failed. By one-tenth of a point, she didn't get valedictorian. But the score was good enough where she got accepted in Tuskegee University. When she, uh, when she graduated, she got accepted in the UAB. When she was in high school, Vivian Malone and James Hood broke those doors open so she could go to the University of Alabama system. And unfortunately, being that there was no black HBCU, the, uh, the black medical students had to go to Howard University, Meharry School of Medicine, and they had to go to other HBCUs. So unfortunately, very proud of her, but my mother became the first black woman in the state of Alabama to graduate from medical school. when she finished at UAB. And she filled a chasm that had been vacant since Edith Thurby Jones did it. And the good thing about this is she made sure that she was on the admissions committee so that other people would have a chance. And, um, I know you're about history. I hear a lot of other good things that I, that I want to hear because I care about, you know, what goes on in my community. But I just want to share that little bit of history with you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience would like to say a few words? Anyone else? Chris, do we have anything else? Let me just again thank uh, Christy Anderson and Ms. Adina Kramer from the city of Montgomery for coming out with us this afternoon. Do our other commissioners have anything you'd like to say as we close out here this afternoon? Any other commissioners? I, I would like to say something. I'd like to applaud my colleagues for the discussion today. Um, <coughs> I, I'm proud to serve with, uh, with colleagues who, who are engaged and who are not sitting up here simply to fill a space. I, um, I think it's exciting and I do look forward to what comes out of that information session. Right. And I'd like to uh, applaud our commissioners, uh, other commissioners also. Very invigorating uh, discussion. So with that being said, this meeting is hereby adjourned.